on to the third topic of our the, the, the five graphical components I was mentioning, is, which is effects. Uh, effects has always been pretty a big topic in Battlefield because we have so many vehicles and so many different types of stuff happening in the game. We can't just script uh, everything in multiplayer of, oh yeah, here should be a giant explosion. It needs to be stuff that, that just work out of the box uh, and uh, stuff, uh, different types of effects that interact with the environment and that, uh, that really are dynamic in a really interesting nature. T typically our effects are built up by uh, thousands of both really small as well as really big particles. And we have both sprite particles, which are just uh, pretty much just a quad being, being rendered with a texture on, as well as mesh particles, which are real meshes uh, that, that rotate and, and fly around in the environment. Uh, and we use a little bit of different types of stuff there. And one, th one key thing that we found out when working with our effects is that the, the most important thing with effects is that it's not really the in individual look of a specific effect of working on that in that in isolation. The most important thing with an effect is that it fits into the environment. And a big portion of this is lighting. Most games just use uh, a single texture on their particles and they fly around there. And it can look pretty OK if it's a pretty static game or a pretty static lighting environment. But with our type of interaction in our environments, we found that adding proper lighting to our uh, effects in our particles adds a lot. So it's all about lighting again. Um, so here's a, another particle sh uh, screenshot. I've, I've been running with this tank, just shooting at the ground. Got a little bit, little bit of a smoke cloud there. Uh, it doesn't look super remarkable, but it, it has quite a lot of interesting components here. Uh, first of all, you don't see a hard intersection uh, between the particles and the terrain here. It's just soft and sort of just fits in. That's what we call soft particles. We do a soft fade between the particle and the, the terrain instead of a hard seed test, which is more efficient but, but looks really bad, actually. Uh, because the particles you're rendering, even though they're just sprites, there's supposed to be a, a volumetric effect that you're rendering. So any type of hard artifact in them, uh, the clipping against geometry looks really bad. Uh, we're also combining in with some, some other particles here that are just alpha tested. So they actually have hard edges on them, but they're smaller details, just create this noise. And this picture looks kind of weird with just three different clusters of alpha tested debris. But in motion, this looks really good uh, on, on the way it interacts with stuff here. It gives some sharp details to the effects. And one major innovation that we've done here, an experiment with Frostbite 2, is, is to have particle shadows. So th uh, this particle cloud here actually casts a shadow on the ground. And this is something we have enabled by default when using the medium or higher sh shadow quality modes in the game. It, because it can be quite heavy to, to render this, but it looks really remarkable in motion. Here we have a giant explosion that has been going off here before. And here's particle shadows on. If you just look at this picture, it's a little bit difficult to tell where are the particle shadows here. Uh, and that's a good thing, because good particles, they actually fit into the environment. They just create this overall pleasing picture. You don't see, what, you don't see a single artifact that really stands out and looks weird or say that, oh, that looks wrong, they don't have that. Uh, it, it just fits together. But if I disable the shadows, then you actually see a pretty major difference here. Uh, so here you see also in motion, uh, and here's disabled, uh, of, of how the particles get, sort of give life to the shadows here. Another aspect of uh, particles and effects in general is lighting the actual particle. Well, I actually don't know of any games that do this except for us now, is that we have a volumetric uh, lighting system for our particles. So every particle we have in the environment can be lit by all the, all the other light sources we have in the environment. And this really creates a kind of uh, super interesting visuals, I think, of it really fits in the particles. So you have a small muscle flash there, and it's just subtly, uh, it's just a very sub subtle effect of just lighting up the particles around it because we have put a lot of type of mist particles around in this environment. And here you have a big, uh, well, big mortar uh, with, a, with a flare on it uh, falling down and lighting up the environment around it. Uh, and here's just some smaller effects also. And th this is also just yet another component that makes our lighting and our particles fit in together. And it's a really automatic thing for us after we implemented all of the code for this, that is. Uh, it, it just, we can just throw in particles in any type of lighting environment and it just work. Uh, and it looks really cool in motion. So uh, as, just as the particles can uh, receive light, they can also uh, cast light. So here we have uh, light sources on, our, on some of our particles, not on all of them, that would be, be a bit, wouldn't really be visible, but, but on some of the important ones. So uh, you can see here that the entire tunnel here has been lit up uh, by a particle from that fire. But also the, the, the smaller fire up close uh, also has uh, it's lighting up the environment around it. So it's also another aspect that makes the entire environment fit together well. So here's an example of the particle lighting that looks pretty sweet in motion. When you have this, uh, these giant SAM missiles going up and just lighting up their own smoke clouds uh, behind them. Really proud of those type of uh, visuals and effects that simply just work. The artist just plays a light source uh, in there. 
So the, the, all of these are, can, can happen during gameplay also of just playing the game and having some big smoke cloud going up from a, from a tank uh, that's using smoke or some smoke grenades or something like that, and then there's explosion going off nearby. Perhaps not as spe spectacular as this effect, but this is on, on a multiplayer level. Another small, small aspect of lighting, now we have light sources that can cast light, they can receive light, and they can cast a shadow. We also have, there's also a traditional problem in many games that uh, light sources don't receive shadows themselves. So you have a big, you have this strong sun lighting up a particle, that's pretty easy to do, but then you also have uh, areas of the scene, especially in urban environments, we found this to be super important, as well as indoor, uh, that you need to have the particles be able to be shadowed from the sun also. So uh, we've done this uh, all the time, actually, in Frostbite, and this was also part of BC2, but we refined it further a little bit, uh, of, of casting a shadow on all our particles. And it's very apparent in many of the urban environments. If, if I would just have shown you the picture in motion when playing the game, you probably wouldn't have seen it that much. But uh, you would, well, if I showed you the upper screenshot, you wouldn't have seen what's, what's different by this. But when you disable the effect, you, it, it doesn't fit in at all and looks bad. Now, so here's a, when you put everything together, these are the type of things that can happen. <laughs> so this is just a big combination of all the different types of lighting on particles and shadows of particles and, and just giant amounts of particles in general um, with good animation. Uh, good work by the effect artist there. Let's move on to terrain. Terrain is really another big aspect of uh, all the Battlefield games that we always have. We always had large-scale terrains, and we're, we're proud of returning back to that uh, major heritage uh, now with BF3 as well, uh, to have even larger scale than we had, had in BC2. So we have really quite vast view distance on, on many terrain, and not all landscapes, but many of the landscapes on multiplayer levels, like the Operation Firestorm level you're playing here. And this is uh, made up of a couple of uh, important components here. First of all, the memory, memory requirements for having giant terrains is actually quite, can require a lot of memory, both for the height fields, and, but also for the textures and the normal maps and, and all the type of detail that you want to fit in there. So we've developed a, a sort of hierarchical streaming system for our terrains that, so you can seamlessly just move over the terrain and it streams in higher detail as you get closer to the individual objects because you can't see all the detail in a distance. But at the same time as we did that, we really wanted to be able to see all this small type of, of of um, well, mountains and detail in the distance of the trains, uh, but, well, both on the actual silhouettes of the train, but also inside the train. And we did this, uh, we implemented this by using uh, sort of per pixel normal maps. So we have this pretty high resolution height fields of load in that we uh, convert over to, to normal maps uh, to be able to light them on a per pixel level correctly. So that's why you still see all the detail inside the uh, inside the mountains here, uh, on the sides of them. Well, with the X11, we could go even further there. So we implemented support for both tessellation and displacement mapping, so it sort of go hand to hand with our terrain. It's a very nicely fit, fit in very nicely in order to create even further detail on the terrain to keep our silhouettes and stuff like that. So here's another terrain screenshot that we'll zoom in a little bit on, where you can see that. So well, you see a lot of detail here in general, but if we zoom in on it, so, th uh, so this is how it looks like when you're using just standard normal mapping. If you just look at this screenshot, it looks pretty good. It looks actually, well, the internals of the train look really good, in my own opinion at least. But the silhouettes, we don't really have that many triangles to be able to keep correct silhouettes everywhere, especially when moving around dynamically in this environment. So the silhouettes are a little bit uh, lower as here. But then when we add the displacement mapping instead, we really keep this, uh, these high resolution height fields and keep the full detail we have on, on, on the edges there. Uh, and this is something we can only do on DX11 because we're rendering this train now with, instead of rendering with 100,000 triangles or something like that, we're rendering with a million triangles uh, in these type of scenes. Uh, with good performance, um, actually, which is pretty good <laughs> with, with all the DX11 GPUs. Uh, so this is enabled with a train quality setting in the engine when you set it to high or you set it to ultra. It's not really apparent on all levels, though, like Operation Metro, even if you displace mapping there, it doesn't really matter because it's just a flat park area. But these type of mountainous levels, it's a lot more visible on. Uh, another really imp uh, important aspect of terrain is not just the geometry. If you have a lot of geometry, if you have a million triangles on the terrain, it doesn't really look like a terrain. You need good textures on the terrain. You need a good way of shading and rendering the terrain. So we developed a scheme that we called uh, that we call procedural virtual texturing uh, on our train, which is a method of uh, combining tons of different types of textures and many, many layers of terrain 
uh, uh, sort of in a semi-procedural fashion uh, across our terrain and render that into a virtual texture. This is not not really the same thing as the, the uh, id uh, mega texturing because they just load the giant textures. Here we're instead generating these textures uh, in game. So there's different pros and cons with both of these approaches. Uh, but the reason why we, why we chose this approach is that well, first of all, we don't have to have huge storage of just having static textures and. At the same time, we, we have a lot of dynamic stuff going on in our game. We have dynamic destruction on the height field, so you can destroy the landscape. Just, uh, we create the craters dynamically, and they also need to affect the, the texturing of the terrain. Uh, and this is also, in general, actually an optimization, because we can uh, take, instead of rendering for every pixel, rendering 10 different layers of the terrain in, well, inside a shader, just combining multiple textures and multiple type of uh, noise functions and, and uh, uh, artist created effects in order to create different materials. We can just do that once and then render it into uh, a texture and then reuse that texture. Not reuse it for the entire game, but reuse it for perhaps 100 frames. So we save a lot of performance uh, with this method also. And, and it enables us to have long, even longer view distance that while keeping this uh, detail. It's not just detail texturing that's happening only up close and then it's just a color map, that, which is what we did, did in BF2. This is a, a lot more, more detail here. And here you can actually see the tiles that we're rendering on the terrain. This is seamless in the actual game. This is just a visualization to see that there's different resolutions. Up close, it's higher resolution. In the distance, it's lower resolution. But in practice, you, you should not see this as, uh, very much. And this is also affected a little bit with the terrain quality setting in the game, where we, on ultra, we just crank this up a lot more. And on low, we just keep it, uh, keep it uh, uh, pretty low res. Uh, but it still looks pretty good. Uh, so the, these tiles that we're rendering are really like 256 by 256 uh, tiny textures. Uh, that we generate out, when, when, once you move closer to an area, we split it up and generate out high resolution texture, uh, well, render out more tiles there. And then we also compress them in real time to DXT5, which saves uh, quite a bit of memory. So we store them out in DXT5 instead of uncompressed textures. So we let the GPU compress them. And here's uh, sort of the, a big atlas of all of these sort of uh, ram uh, half random mess of te small texture tiles that we store in a giant texture that we then use later on. Uh, the left one is, I think, is the height field, and the middle one is the color map they see here. It sort of matches in color, and the green one is very difficult to see here, but it's it's the it's the normal maps on the terrain that we cache out because we have a lot of normal detail there that uh, the artist can add. Another thing about our terrain and landscapes is that uh, just having good geometry and good texturing is still not enough. You you need a lot of uh, geometric detail up close of having small sh shrubs and bushes and 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 grass and things like that. Uh, this type of area on, on this level here. So we have a system uh, that we've, we've had it for quite a while in our games, but we've improved it quite significantly here to work with this procedural virtual texturing and to work with our landscape systems, uh, something we call terrain decoration, which is this type of grass objects. And that's actually, this is not meshes or, or standard objects that we place on the level. This is something we procedurally generate as you're moving across the level seamlessly. So if we would save out all of these on this level, I, I, haven't, I haven't done any calculations, but it would probably take yeah, I don't know, 10 gigabytes of storage or something, just saving all of those instances uh, of objects there. But instead, we procedurally generate it as moving over the terrain seamlessly, and we fade, it, fade this in. So it's a highly scalable system, uh, and it's based on the exact materials we have in the terrain. So you can see some, some uh, uh, areas of the, the foliage here where it's sort of missing, where it doesn't have anything, but it's a different material on the ground there. So that's sort of the reason. So it fits together quite nicely, and that's a lot of detail and very easy for us to, to create and add this to levels and for the artists to control it. Here we have some, uh, an example of a, uh, this is Caspian border actually, uh, an example of how it looks like with the terrain decoration off. This is actually, you can't play the game like this because we don't, we don't allow you to turn off these effects because it would be too, too easy to see everyone hiding in the grass and things like that. But, but this is how it looks like there with that. And here we add uh, on the lowest detail of, of our mesh scattering, uh, oh no, uh, terrain decoration. So we add a lot of grass, some, uh, uh, some smaller bushes and some flowers there also. Uh, it looks really quite nice, a much more pleasing picture than this one. But then we have, it's pretty scalable, so we, we have the other detail level sources. Here's medium detail, and here's high detail, and here's ultra detail. You see it sort of adds a little bit up close, that's a little bit more flowers up close, and in distance it adds a little bit more grass. So it's quite scalable, and it's a little bit of balance. We don't want to have it scale too much, uh, because then it would be too easy to cheat by seeing everyone who's prone in the grass. It's a little bit of a balance there, but I think it works really quite nicely. And here's the difference between ultra and low. Um, between these type of systems.